Over the last few weeks, we've been talking about and our concern has been dealing with the issue of fear. And one of the main reasons that we are concerned about fear is that fear so easily dominates in all our lives to the point where often it literally paralyzes us. And if it doesn't paralyze us, at least what it does, it holds us back and keeps us from experiencing the things in life that we want to experience and it keeps us from being able to do the things in life that we know that we ought to do. Too often we find ourselves, in spite of the fact that we know who is Lord, we know who God is, we know that we're supposed to have faith in him, we still end up walking day by day more in fear than we do in faith. And we know that's not right. We know it's not the way to victory. We know it doesn't succeed. That it's ultimately a dead end path. And yet, in spite of our best efforts, many times, this is what we end up doing. And every one of us, every single one of us here today, wants to find that place of peace. We want to find that place that where we are free from anxiety, where the burdens don't weigh upon us, but especially where the fears don't come in and dominate within our lives, where when we wake up in the morning, there is joy in our hearts, there is peace. We want to find that place that could be described as the, the pasture that's cool water and the tall green grass that's talked about in, in the 23rd Psalm. The place where the sheep just loll around with no cares and no worries, plenty of living water to drink. They're not going to contaminate that water supply because the stream is flowing by and they're going to have lots and lots of grass to eat. And it's just a place of comfort and a place of peace. We're all wanting to find that place. And we know that as long as fear rules in our lives, or well, even more than that, as long as fear exists within our lives, that kind of peace is going to be elusive. We're not going to find that place of perfect peace. But there is such a place. There is such a state where there is no fear, where fear has not only no place, but does not even exist. And where there is nothing but perfect peace. We call it death. When you die, there is no fear. Fear doesn't scare a dead person. For those who know the Lord, who die in the Lord, it says that they who are children of God go to be in the presence of God. And in the presence of God, there can be no fear. Because God's presence drives fear out. That's what the power of God does. Do you remember the psalm? It says, let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord. He heard me and delivered me from my fears. In the 23rd Psalm, it says, I fear no evil. Why? Because the presence of God is there. And when we die and we go to be in the presence of God, there is no fear. There is perfect peace. So the way to find that place of peace is to die. Now, what if you don't know the Lord? Well, there's not going to be any fear there either, because fear is basically anticipation. It is what you expect to happen or what you expect might happen. That's what fear is. Fear is something that is not yet there, but it's something that you are worried about or anxious about. If it's a physical threat, you're afraid of the pain that might come. If it is an emotional threat, you're afraid of the pain that might be there. Whatever it may be, it is always in the future. Pain is, or rather fear is anticipation of pain in some way. And when you die outside of the Lord, you're experiencing the destruction. You're experiencing the devastation. You experience that for which, that which people are afraid of. There's no reason for fear because it's there. You're going through it. So regardless, when we die, you're free from fear. You can't scare a dead person. Try going in a cemetery and try to frighten them. See what kind of reaction you get. You don't get a reaction at all. Why? They are dead to the things that produce fear. There is no pain when it's dead. There is no sensitivity. It's kind of like dead skin. 
You can't hurt it because it's dead. There's no feeling there. There's no sensitivity there. And so dead skin is dead skin. You can tear at it. You can cut at it. You can pick at it. And there is no pain. Therefore, there is no fear. So the answer to find that place of perfect peace is to die. Now, God does not want us to be that drastic. In fact, God came to give us life, not death. He came to give us life and life more abundantly. And his plan is that we be able to walk victoriously in this life free from the power of fear in our lives. Because fear is the tool of the enemy to destroy us. And so his plan is to provide a way where you and I can live our lives free from the rule of fear and can walk in its opposite, which is faith, which is trust in God. His intention is that we not have to die to experience that kind of freedom from fear. First Timothy or rather 2 Timothy 1.7, says this, For God did not give us a spirit of, and the NIV says, timidity, but a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Now, another translation of that says, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Now, technically what this is saying, because the word, what it's saying, the gifts of God are power, That is the strength to accomplish, the strength to do. Dunamis, which is the power of God. And love, and perfect love casts out all fear. And of a stable mind. That's what God gives. And it says he does not give us fear or timidity. The word in Greek doesn't mean terror. What it actually means is fearfulness that causes us to pull back. Not to cower in fear, but it says God God does not give us a spirit where we're afraid to try, we're afraid to venture out, where we're afraid to take risks, we're afraid to be vulnerable. God instead gives us a spirit of love and of power and gives us a spirit of a sound mind, a stable mind. That's God's gift. That's God's intention. His intention for our lives is boldness. His intention for our lives is endurance. His intention for our lives is patience and peace. And joy. I mean, after all, if his intention for our lives was not a state of peace, why in the world would Jesus say, my peace I leave with you? My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. I give you my kind of peace. It's not the kind of peace the world offers. My kind of peace changes lives. It's on the inside. It'll transform who you are. My kind of peace is walking without being ruled by fear. If that wasn't God's intention, Jesus wouldn't have said that. If that was not God's intention, Jesus would never have given it. But he gives us peace. That's his purpose. He comes. He is called the Prince of Peace, the Sar Shalom. And that kind of peace doesn't just mean I'm not fighting with my neighbors. That kind of peace means there's a sense of well-being on the inside because my relationships are where they need to be. My relationship with God and my relationship with other people. It's where it needs to be. There's a sense of well-being and a prosperity in my life. There's a sense of health and wholeness within me. That's what that word means when it says he gives his peace. That's the opposite. Of that fear. God's intention is not that we live in fear, but that we live in peace. So the issue is how do we get there? If it's so elusive, how do we get that kind of peace within our lives? The answer sounds simple, but it's really rather complex. But it's something we say all the time and we say without thinking about what it means and we just throw it out all the time. But the solution is this. We have to die while we live. (laughs) Now that sounds contradictory because in the minds of most people, living and dying are mutually exclusive terms. If you die, then you're not living. And if you're living, you're not dying. I mean, it's it means they're opposites, it seems. But the real solution is you have to die while you live. 
Now, the way the Bible puts that is you have to die to self. You have to die to self. Now, what does that mean? Dying to self means I have to die to that characteristic within me that says me, my, my way, my ideas, my desires, my plans, my agenda. I have to be willing to die to the part of self that says I want control. I know what is best. I am going to be the determiner of the course of my own life. I have to be willing to die to those things, meaning I have to be willing to give them up. I have to be willing to say that my way is not necessarily the best way. My ideas are not necessarily the wisest ideas. My plans are not necessarily the best of plans. My desires are not necessarily what's good for me. And I have to be willing to say, I'm willing to let that part of me die. To literally cease to exist. Dying to self doesn't mean that I quit living and I quit enjoying life and I just can't do anything at all. It means that part of me, which is self-centered, which is uh, dependent and self-reliant upon only me, dependent upon me and self-reliant. That part of me has to die because there is a reality. The reality is this. The extent to which I try to control my life will determine the level of fear in which I will live. The more I try to control my life and get my agenda across and get my ways, the greater the level of fear I'm going to live in. Because anything that would thwart those plans will create fear in me. There are certain arenas where fear thrives. And fear thrives in the arena of the self. And self-will. It thrives in areas of my agenda. Because what creates fear in me? When there are plans I've made for my life and plans the way I think things ought to work out and suddenly I see a threat to those plans, I am afraid I'm not going to get my way. And fear, so the more I try to control it, the greater the level of fear is going to be. If I feel like I have to protect myself and my security is left up to me, then my fear level is going to be very high because everything that comes along is going to look like it's a threat to my existence or to my safety or to my health or to my pleasure and comfort. The more me lives in me, the higher fear lives in me. The stronger fear is. The more I'm able to say I give up me, the less power fear is going to have over my life. That's what it means to die to self. It means to relinquish and give up that part of me that makes demands, that part of me that is hypersensitive, that part of me that gets offended so easily, that part of me that, that looks is always looking for someone to do me wrong. I have to be willing to give that part of me up and say it doesn't have a place in my life because that part of me will lead to death. And in its place, I'm going to reach out for life. I'm going to reach out for God's way. Where there are issues, where rather where self is still the main issue in our lives, fear is going to rule. Where I feel that I stand alone or am dependent upon myself, in that arena, fear is going to thrive. Now, that's the reality of life. And so the answer is, I have to die in those areas so that fear has no power over them. Those parts of me that are concerned about self-preservation and self-protection and making sure that I don't get hurt either physically, emotionally, or spiritually, that part of me has got to die. And when it dies, there is no feeling. And if there's no feeling, there can be no fear. It's like the dead skin. 
Nothing can hurt it because there's no sensitivity there. Now, that's exactly what this particular passage of Scripture that Paul Wright is talking about. The, he's talking about a process of dying to self, which means yielding life, lifestyles, and life choices to the Lord. And do you hear those three? That's important to remember. Because often we say, well, I've yielded things to the Lord, but we've only done it in a limited fashion. And the, the degree to which we have yielded these things to the Lord is going to determine how much God rules in us and how much fear rules in us. But the three areas that we have to relinquish to God that we have to die in, we have to relinquish and yield our lives. That is the direction, the course, the determination of who we are and where we're going. Also, our life styles. That is the way we live. And our life choices, how we react, how we respond how we deal with situations. All of those three areas have to be yielded to God. That's what it means to die to self. And so Paul begins this passage and he says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy. Now he's been talking about how wonderful God is. He's been talking about how more, I know this wonderful grace of God, how much God loves us and how great God is that he took us from people who did not know truth and did not have the light in our lives. And he has completely changed us. And now he is showering his mercy on us and he is redeeming us from death. And he said, now, this is the kind of God we're talking about. So when we're talking about giving our lives up. We're not putting them in the hands of some dictator over here who doesn't care about us. We're putting them in the hands of a God who loves us more than we could ever know and ever understand and ever conceive. A God who created us and loves us with an everlasting love. That's the mercies of God. Now, when you think about that, you realize, he says, that what I'm asking you to do is not a terrible thing. It's really a right thing. It's a good thing. It's the best thing. And so he says, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, that you offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Now, you notice what he says. Give your bodies as a living sacrifice unto the Lord. Now, it's real interesting because this passage of Scripture, the terminology that Paul uses is reflective of temple worship, the temple worship that he knew as a, as a rabbi that was known in the world. They would bring their sacrifices unto the Lord. They would bring sacrifices daily. In fact, there was daily. There were there were thousands of sacrifices being offered on the temple mount at every day. It was called the daily ablation or the daily sacrifices. And he's saying, I want you not to bring a dead animal. Not to bring an animal that's going to have to lose its life. Because you see, that kind of sacrifice, the blood sacrifice, was not because God was gory. It's because life was in the blood and that blood represented themselves being poured out on the altar. And he said, now Christ has been offered as the sacrifice for all time. The blood has been shed. Christ shed his blood. Now what's left is for you to put yourself on that altar. It becomes your body, but you don't have to die to do it because he's already died in your place. So now you offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, a living sacrifice, which is your spiritual act of worship. And that word literally means which is the proper temple ceremony. It is the proper way to worship God. To offer yourselves as a living sacrifice. Well, some interesting things are true when, a, when you have a sacrifice. A sacrifice has no rights. A sacrifice technically loses its life. A sacrifice can make no demands. A sacrifice has no expectations other than to die. So what is he saying about our bodies? He's saying that what we need to do is to offer to God that part of us which keeps saying, oh, me first. And saying, you no longer have any rights. 
You no longer have any privileges. You no longer have the right to make demands. You no longer have the right to have expectations. And you think, but that's not fair. Wait a minute. Remember, we're being put in the hands of a God who loves us more than we understand and who knows what's best for us and is going to do for us when we look back so much greater than we could have done for ourselves. And he's saying, let the part of you that thinks it knows best die and let God have that part of you. And when you look back, you're going to say, wow, did I ever make the right choice? I didn't know life could be this great. I didn't know there could be this much joy. I didn't know I could have this much peace. I didn't know there could be this much victory in life. But he said, it's not going to happen until you offer yourselves as a living sacrifice unto the Lord. And see, a living sacrifice doesn't actually have to die. It does, but it doesn't. Part of it dies. It gives up itself, but it doesn't have to lose its vitality. It doesn't lose its life. In fact, it gains life. And that's the one of the beautiful things about this is to die to self is to gain life. It is not the other way around. The world says, oh, if you die to self, then you're just going to cease to exist. No, if I die to self, it's going to be exactly the opposite. I'm going to have more life. I'll have greater strength. I'll have greater wisdom, greater understanding. If I'm willing to give up that part of me. When a sacrifice is offered, it belongs to the one to whom it is given. So when the sacrifice was placed on the altar in the temple time, that sacrifice belonged to God. Do you remember why God told him not to eat blood? He says, because the blood belongs to me. I've given that for atonement of sin. He even tells him about fat. He says, the fat belongs to me. If we would listen to him, we wouldn't have as much trouble today because he says fat belongs to him. Therefore, we shouldn't be eating it. Makes good sense. But you see, whatever is sacrificed belongs to the recipient of the sacrifice. When we place our bodies as a living sacrifice, then who do we belong to? We belong to God. We have given up the right to claim my way, me first, and now I belong to God. And therefore, I die to self, to will, to rights, and to demands. Jesus said it when he was talking to his disciples, he'd been talking about his own death. It's shortly after Peter had made the proclamation, you are the divine Messiah, found in the Gospel of Luke. He makes this statement in chapter 9, verse 23. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very soul? That's exactly what Paul is talking about here. He's saying, don't you understand that when you present your bodies to God and you give your life to God as a sacrifice, you don't lose anything. You gain everything. There is no loss of life. You gain real life. You gain freedom because the way of self is a lie. It cannot accomplish. It cannot reach the goals. It cannot do what you think it needs to do. Your own control cannot get you where you need to be. And so it is a way of deception and a way of death. God is the only one who knows how to get you from where you are to where, for, to where you need to be. He says, so when you give your life to him as a sacrifice, then God is free to put you where you need to be and to move you in the direction you need to go in. And that's life. That is victory. But he also says, if anyone would come after me, that is to be my disciple. Now, understand, to be my disciple. A disciple gave up the right to his own claims, to his own life. If you're going to be the disciple of a master in Jesus' day, you left your home, you left your family, you left your job, and you lived with the master, you did what the master did, you went where the master went, you studied at his feet, you became a part and an extension of him. You gave up everything of yourself. And see, that's what he's saying. If you're going to be a disciple, you've got to realize that you've got to be willing to give up your demand to your rights and become a disciple of mine and I will lead you in the path 
23rd Psalm says it. When it says he is my shepherd, it says he leads me in the right paths. It doesn't say I go the right paths and he walks along with me. He leads me in the right paths. That's what God does. He leads us in the right way. That's the way of life. That's the way of victory. And that's what Jesus says we have to do. And you also notice it says in Luke's gospel, he must take up his cross daily. Denying self, dying to self mean the same thing. Taking up the cross. This was before the crucifixion. It did not have the reference that we have today. What does it mean? I mean, these people, they knew what crucifixion was. It was a horrible way to die. But wait a minute. How can you take up your cross daily if you die? You see, he's talking about a living sacrifice here. To daily crucify the flesh. To daily crucify that self. To daily put it to death and say you no longer exist. You're the old man and, and, and I nail you to the tree and I don't want to have anything else to do with you because I am now the property of God. I now belong to him and he is going to rule in my life. Now he goes on in verse 2 of, of chapter 12 and he says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, the word that we get, if you're probably more familiar with it in the King James, but be not conformed to this world, but be transformed with the renewal of your mind. And it goes on. That do not be conformed is the word in Greek that we get the English word schematic from. It is a drawing out a pattern of how the thing operates. And so the NIV here has a good translation of it when it says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. That's exactly what that word means. It means that the world has a pattern of a way of dealing with things, and you're not to be like them. You don't conform yourself to them, but you are to be transformed, totally changed. See, there are three words that are operative in Christian experience and in the life of our relationship with God. You find them all through the Bible. One word is restoration. One word is reformation. One word is transformation. Now, we all like restoration. Because restoration means basically that I've been confirmed that where I was was good and God's going to take me back to where I was. Things are going to be restored and put back the way that they should have been. And we all love restoration because restoration is a very positive process. But he didn't say, and be restored. He also said, did not say, and be uh, reformed or go through reformation. Because a reformation changes the bad parts, but it leaves the good parts alone. It only takes the bad out and says, okay, we're going to get rid of the bad, put the good in. But it's basically saying, reformation says, well, you're not all bad because some of the things you've been doing are pretty good. We'll just get rid of the bad parts. But we're not comfortable with this word transformation because transforms means everything changes. That everything is thrown out. Everything is made new. Nothing is allowed to carry over. Only what God blesses is allowed to be carried over. It's like with Moses with the rod when he threw it down. Now, God could have kept that rod right there on the ground, but when he told him to pick it up, then he picked it up by God's order. God says, now you can use it. Now you use it in the right way. And when he was out in the desert, and that's the way it is. If God says, this is okay, then it's all right. But see, transformation says everything has to be put on the altar. Everything. Nothing can be cut back. I can't say, but Lord, I like this part of me. You can't do it. You have to put it on the altar. And then if God says, I like that part of you too, then you can pick it back up again. But if he doesn't, then it's got to die. It's got to die. And so he says, let your minds be renewed, made new again, by not just simply adjusting your forms of behavior, but literally by transforming the very way you think. So that you don't think the way the world thinks. How does the world think? The world thinks this way. Oh, we're in trouble now. The world thinks, oh, let's don't go out at night because you're in danger if you do. Oh, you better put 15 locks on every door. The world thinks, oh, if you don't get your way, then it's going to be terrible. The world thinks, don't, don't trust people because they'll hurt you. 
The world thinks in terms of negatives. But what does God say? Paul says it beautifully in Philippians. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Think about these kinds of things. Fill your mind with what is beautiful. Fill your mind with God. Fill your mind with what is hopeful. Fill your mind with the promises of God. Quit looking at the world and listening to them. They'll lead you to death. But think about what God has to offer. Think about the beauty of what God is doing. Think about the glory of the promises of God. Fill your life and your mind with these things. That will transform your way of thinking. Fear can't rule when you're, when you're proclaiming the promises of God and the hope of God. Because it has no place in your life. You're squeezing it out. You're not focused on what you're losing. You're focused on what you're gaining. You're focusing on what's ahead, not what is behind you. And when, and he goes on in this passage, he says, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And here's the kicker. And the God of peace will be with you. When you start doing these things, not just know it's true, when you start doing them, guess what happens? The God of peace who delivers me from my fear suddenly is with me. The God of what? The God of peace. What have I been seeking? Peace. What happens? The God who brings peace suddenly is with me in my life whenever I start filling myself with him and with his goodness. And I quit looking at life the way the world looks at life. Now, this is wonderful. This is great. The question is, how do we do it? And I'm going to give it to you very simply in two statements. Of course, I'm going to say a few things about each statement, but in two statements. (laughs) Statement number one is this. You have to choose not to fear. You say, well, it can't be that simple. Yes, it can be that simple. What did Jesus say? I give you authority over the power of the enemy. The power of the enemy is fear. He's given me authority over fear, which means I can make a decision. I choose not to be ruled by fear. And I think it's important to be said out loud. We're going to do it once today. I'm going to have you do it with me again. I want you to say these words after me. As an act of my will, I choose not to fear. It will not rule me. It will not dominate me. It will not control me. I will not be in bondage. Jesus has set me free. I will live in freedom. Fear has no place in my life. Didn't hurt, did it? And yet that proclamation, making that proclamation daily, says to the enemy, I will not accept what you try to do to me. I will refuse to accept it. I will not live by fear. I will not be ruled by fear. Jesus has set me free. I will be ruled by him. And I will not be ruled by fear. And I think it's important to say out loud because we're hearing it ourselves and we're proclaiming it to the heavens when we speak that word. And you say, well, it just couldn't be that easy. Yes, it can be just that easy. After all, fear is nothing but a fuzzball demon is all mouth. He has no substance to him. Think about what fear is. Fear is a shadow that appears larger than it actually is. How many times do we anticipate things happening and when it gets there, it's not half as bad as we expected it. Fear is nothing but a fuzzball. And what is a fuzzball? It looks bigger than it actually is. And it's all mouth, screaming, screaming. But if it's all mouth, that means there's no substance to it. That's all fear really is. And when we realize that, we realize it has no power over us. We'll walk in freedom and we will walk in victory. Now, that's only half of it. The other half is the critical half then I have to choose to let God rule in my life. I have to make a decision that I'm going to let God rule in my life, 
my lifestyle, and my life choices. Now, that doesn't mean when I get up in the morning, I walk to the closet and I'll say, okay, God, what shirt do I put on today? God gives me wisdom to be able to make those decisions. But I tell you what it does mean. It does mean that I get up in the morning and I say, Lord, I want you to guide me today, even in the selection of my clothes. Guide me so that what I select is going to be appropriate for what you're going to want me to do today. And that's not foreign, but that's making the decision. I want the Lord. I want Jesus to be ruler of my life. I want him to be Lord of the throne of my life. I don't want to walk by fear. I'm going to choose to let God rule. Now, I can choose, say, I'm not going to live in fear, but if I don't let God rule, then that's worthless. The only way it works is if I say I'm going to let God rule in my members, in my body, in my mind, in my soul, in my decisions, in my choices, in my lifestyle, in my responses to people. And let me tell you what that's going to mean. It means you're going to have to make a decision constantly on what you're going to do. You're going to have to choose not to gossip, as tempting as it is. You're going to have to choose to say, if it's not helping them, if it's not building them up, then it doesn't need to be spoken. You're going to have to choose not to have judgmentalism or a critical spirit in you so that when you see things that you're constantly putting people down or you're constantly saying bad things about them, you're going to have to choose not to let that thing gain a hold in your life. You're going to have to choose to ex- respond to people with love. You're going to have to choose to give up the right to get revenge. You're going to have to choose to make all those kinds of decisions that you're going to live in peace with people, that you're going to be kind and you're going to be loving and you're going to be patient and you're going to be understanding. Those are choices you're going to have to make if God's going to rule in your life. See, that's the way it goes. It's not going to be some miracle little pill that I just make a little statement and everything's going to be fine because I'm going to have to fight it out. Daily, I have to offer my body as a living sacrifice. Daily, I have to say, I'll take up my cross today. And a cross isn't a burden. When Jesus went to the cross, it was a willing giving of himself. He didn't, he he says, nobody took my life from me. I gave it. And that's what he says we have to do. We have to be willing to give our lives to the Lord and say, Lord, you rule in my choices. I have to choose to let the Holy Spirit be my guide, my teacher, my leader every single day of my life. That needs to be a choice. That's the way we walk in victory. That's the way we overcome the fear. We don't have time this morning, but I was going to read, and I want you to read a passage of Scripture. I want you to write it down somewhere. I want you to go home. I want you to read it prayerfully. And when you read it, you're going to know exactly why I've asked you to read this. It is Galatians 5, 16 through 25. I'll repeat that. It is Paul's letter to the Galatians. Chapter 5, verse 16 through 25. And when you read it, you will know because it is the word of the Lord to all of us on how to break the power of the fear. Read it, reread it, pray about it, study it, reread it again. For if God ever gave us a formula of walking in victory, this is the formula on how to walk in victory. So this is the issue. If we want to break the power of fear, we have to be willing to die to self. We have to be willing to choose not to walk in fear. And we have to choose to let the Lord rule in our lives instead. That means we have to literally put all that we have and all that we are on the altar.